Hey everybody, Jared Marlow here with the Blue and Gray Education Society. And if you watched our video on the Battle of McDowell, then you know who this guy right here is. This is Aaron Seaver uh, from Aaron Civil War Travels, for those of you who don't know. Um, I'm going to let Aaron introduce himself a little bit here before we get started for those who, did, who didn't watch the McDowell video. So, um, Aaron, is there anything you want to tell us about yourself? Sure. Uh, yeah, Aaron Seaver. Uh... Currently, I'm a park ranger for the Shenandoah Valley Battlefields Foundation here in the National Historic District. Uh, so I get to go and be on all these wonderful ba valley battlefields uh, pretty much every day. Um, you know, run my own YouTube channel and Facebook page, Aaron Civil War Travels, which is, uh, I like to go to places that are known and unknown. Um, a lot of my videos are, are just in random places that you don't realize there's Civil War history there. Um, and of course, you know, been in Gettysburg and places like that, big, big, big battlefields. But uh, I really like the the smaller things, the smaller campaigns, um, just because they're such an integral part of the Civil War. Um, also, the the human interest stories. You know, you've got so many places you can go with this this style of war. It's amazing. So, All right. That's what about me. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll again we'll put links to Aaron's stuff here in the, in the description so you can follow him on Facebook and on YouTube. Um I, I will say before we go on, you did a video on was it Brock's Gap recently? Yes. Yeah. Uh, that Brock's was that, that was very interesting. Like and it's in the, one of those places that you're driving down the road, there's like a little fork in the road and you don't yep. think too much too much about it, but there was there's a whole lot that happened right there. There's a whole lot that happened there. Yeah, I uh, I grew up right through there, uh, rode my bike through there, rode the school bus through there a lot, um, and kind of ran around when I was a teenager back through there. So <laughs> been there a lot, and uh, even in my younger days, I didn't realize it was a battlefield till probably uh, early two thousands. I started realizing, oh, okay something here and then the more you look into it it's a sharp little fight but it's a sharp fight and that's something that only or you would only get by watching his channel there's no no markers there there's nothing yeah. there interpretive wise yeah so, yeah. so yeah, be sure to check out his pages or somebody that knows the area and is going through there or, or find something like that then uh, you never know it was there yeah like I said, that's that's the that's the appeal of his pages. So be sure to check him out at Aaron's Civil War Travels, and that's on Facebook and YouTube. We'll have the links below. But tonight we have a really special treat because we're going to talk about not one, not two, but three battles that, that all happen consecutively. Uh, yeah, <laughs> technically, yeah. I, have, uh, I, um, I I like to make it four. <laughs> <laughs> well, there was. There was there was a lot going on during and right before one of the battles that did coincide with the other one. Yep. There was just right in that one stretch of road right there. There was a lot going on. Those, um, those three days, June sixth through June ninth, are kind of crazy. Yeah. <laughs> in the local and area. and to to me, they are the when people think Jackson's Valley campaign, like this is probably like the the seminal battles of it. Yeah, and, and really, I mean, I'm one of those that. I think you could take these two battles, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, but I think you could take these two battles, um, really, and what happens right before these two battles, and they could be their own campaign. It's almost like it's a different campaign in a way. Right. Um, but, well, we'll get into that in a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so, anyway, we're we going to talk about tonight the battles of Harrisonburg, or Goods Farm, the Battle mm -hmm. of Cross Keys, and the Battle of Port Republic in Jackson's yep. 1862 Valley Campaign, and Aaron, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you take it away. All right, so really the, the way to understand this part of Jackson's Valley Campaign, uh, really you have to go back to what happened be before these battles. Um, really at the end of the Battle of First Winchester, or the First Battle of Winchester, um, saying that the other way makes it sound like there's a ton of Winchester cities up there. It's one Winchester up there. Um, but the, the first battle of Winchester, um, Jackson's going to move north after he pushes Banks out of the valley, uh, out of the lower valley. He's going to move north and kind of go around Martinsburg for a little while. And part of that is to freak out the D.C. administration there. Um, I don't think Abraham Lincoln is quite as scared as, as maybe 
led on to believe at some points, I think uh, he's influenced by Edwin Stanton, his Secretary of War, um, who is a fanatical crazy guy uh, that, uh, you know, he'll run around, he runs around thinking everything's going to blow up in his face. Um, so when he finds out Jackson's there, he is going to lose his mind, and, and I'm sure that's going to influence the president. Um, because of that, Jackson is going to be facing uh, not only the folks he just beat with Banks, who's going to reform above him, but he's also going to be facing John C. Fremont and James Shields. Shields had been sent away and is now on his way back from the Fredericksburg area to encounter Jackson. And you had John C. Fremont, who at the Battle of McDowell uh, was the overall commander, even though he wasn't on the field, his his uh, troops under Milroy and Shank were involved in that battle. Uh, so Fremont's been in the western area, he'll on the eastern side. And Jackson uh, is going to find this out, and he's going to make a big U-turn and start up the valley toward Port Republic, uh, you know, toward the city of Harrisonburg, Port Republic Cross Keys. When he does that, um, he's going to get to a point, uh, kind of, she could say it's almost halfway, maybe a little, a little less than halfway, uh, but the town of Strasburg, uh, he's going to be there. And those two armies, John C. Fremont and James Shields, honestly could have gotten him right there. Um, but they don't. They don't press their advantage. They're skirmishing on both sides. Jackson just marches through the night and keeps on getting it. And uh, the Union misses a big opportunity there. And that's kind of why I say it's a, it's a different campaign in a way. It's still the Valley campaign, but you could split it based on Jackson's chased the Union out of the Valley. Now they're chasing him. Um, and so as he's going to move up the Valley toward Harrisonburg, those armies are going to want to link together. Jackson, when he gets the Front Royal uh, in that area, the Strasburg area, he's going to he's going to know that if those two armies get together, he's he's overwhelmed. It's too much. He's going to use the Mathanutton Mountain and come back down through the fade or back up through the Page Valley, um, and keep the Mathanutton Mountain, which I'm looking at right outside my window. Uh, he's going to keep that between him and Fremont, which is also keeping it between Fremont and Shields. This way he can, as Shields is coming, you know, pursuing him, Fremont's going to have to stay on the other side of the mountain because Jackson's going to burn all the bridges. Um, he's going to, you know, make it hard for those two armies to get together. Uh, and he's going to use that mountain. You know, we, we hear in the movie Gettysburg, they use the mountains to screen their movements. Well, that's exactly what he's doing here. Uh, he's not using the Blue Ridge. He's using the Mass Nutton for that one. But um, he's going to use that mountain to screen his movements. And, March all the way to Harrisonburg. Uh, you know, it's going to be kind of a forced march, but he's going to make it down here pretty quick. And then he's going to turn around and he's going to determine that he's going to fight both of these armies. He's kept them apart uh, by burning the bridges and things. And he knows, you know, they're, they're going to be able to come together at Port Republic um, if, he can, if he can't beat them. Uh, there's one bridge goes across the North River there in town. In the town of Port Republic, of course, it's been replaced by a modern day bridge. Um, but he is going, when he gets to Harrisonburg, he's going to send his cavalry commander, Turner Ashby, a uh, local hero, kind of that cavalier type guy you think about, uh, probably the Valley's Jeb Stewart, as, as you could say, very flamboyant, and, um, a pretty rough and tough guy, not a great disciplinarian. Um, I would say Stewart's more of a disciplinarian than. than or Turner Ashby was, um, and that actually comes up during this campaign, especially on the, on the way back. Um, Ashby's troops are supposed to burn one of the bridges, the Red Bridge, there in Page County, and they're unable to do so because they got into some Applejack and got drunk, so they can't, can't do that. So Jackson will actually, or for just a little bit, he'll relieve Turner Ashby of command of the cavalry, and the cavalry will basically revolt and say, no, we're not doing that. It's going to be one of the only times that Jackson's going to rescind that. He's, he's going to put Ashby back in command just be like, hey, make the discipline better. Uh, really not a lot he can do with that. Um, he needs that cavalry, and Ashby's a good cavalier. Uh, he just 
the, and he's a good leader of men. It's just his men are not as disciplined as Jack. With that said, uh, you're going to have the Battle of Harrisonburg on June 6th. This is going to be where John C. Fremont's vanguard is starting to come into Harrisonburg toward Jackson. Uh, Ashby is going to see some of these troops. He gets up a little ambush uh, there at Chestnut Ridge Goods Farm, uh, also known as the Battle of Harrisonburg, called several things. Uh, today, it is part of JMU and Dream Come True Park. So if you go over and play in the park, you're kind of on the battlefield. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, you still get there. It's a cool park. But uh, he, Ashby's going to set up this ambush. But the Yankees, the Union troops, are not going to go where he thinks they're supposed to go. And so he's going to have to kind of hightail it and turn around and go up onto the ridge. Um, and a very sharp fight's going to happen up there. Um, you're going to have the Pennsylvania Bucktails involved. Uh, you're going to have Sir Percy Wyndham. Uh, he's going to be involved. Matter of fact, he actually says before uh, before uh, Ashley's untimely death that he is there. He's going to sack Ashby, and he actually gets captured during that battle. He never sees Ashby, but he gets captured during the Battle of Harrisonburg. So he does not sack Ashby. Ashby sacks him. Um, but during this battle, Ashby's horse is going to get shot, and he's going to get impassioned. And he's going to lead a charge. And as he's doing it, he gets shot, pierced through the heart. He's dead. Um, and there's a monument there on Chestnut Ridge that is pretty close to the point. Uh, it sounds, you know, from everything that's been researched, pretty close to the point of his demise. Um, the Confederates will, it's basically a filling out action. Um, so it's not really a, a win or loss there. Um, I would say the Confederates kind of win that because they, they do, you know, capture Percy Wyndham, um, and they kind of check the Union advance. In the meantime, what's happening behind the scenes before we get back to Ashby is General Richard Ewell has been tasked with setting up a defensive position to protect the rear of Jackson's army, who's going to Port Republic. Ewell uh, has moved out toward Harrisonburg, and one of his, uh, I believe it's Colonel Elsie, is going to find a great spot. Uh, for artillery, and just, it's a commanding position, it's a nice ridge, it's called Mill, um, Mill Creek Ridge, uh, also known as Artillery Ridge, because you always going to mass his artillery on this ridge, and it's going to be devastating on the Union troops there later on, but that's happening on June 6th, they're starting to get these dispositions set up in, in the area of Crawford Key, little hamlet outside of Harrisonburg. After Ashby's death, Ashby's body is going to be taken all the way down to the town of Port Republic. And the cavalry is just going to be destroyed. They're basically going to cease to exist as a unit for a little while. They don't know what to do. Um, you know, another commander is going to come in, but they're just not, they're not in the mindset to really do anything. Uh, they're going to be on some picket duty around the town of Port Republic, out in the, out in the Shenandoah River. Um, the North and South Fork, and they are not going to do very well uh, with that. So if we were to fast forward, June 7th, there's a lot of movement. Uh, it's basically the Army setting up for the next day's battle. Um, Yule getting his 5,500 men, or I think it's 50, yeah, it might be 5,800. His 50, I think it's 58. His 5,800 men up on the ridges, ready to go for this battle. While John C. Fremont's 11,500 men were advancing toward him, uh, the Battle of Cross Keys will start around what is now Union Church. Um, it's the Rubicon Hall. It's on Battlefield Road there in Cross Keys. Um, the 58, or 15th Alabama will be in the cemetery loading their rifles and begin skirmishing with Union troops. Now they're going to, it's kind of a, almost like they're, they're coming at an angle. Uh, and Fremont is going to use some veteran troops to make this part of the advance. And it's going to be Milroy and Shane. These guys have been in battle with Jackson. They fought him at, at uh, McDowell. So they're going to start advancing against the artillery ridge position. Uh, and they're not going to be able to make it up the ridge. They're going to get down. There's, there's, the Confederates have a great position. There's rifle pits, massed artillery. It's just the whole Maryland, you've got a Maryland section there uh, on Mill Creek Ridge that is just, there's not a lot they can do there. 
Um, Milroy will say, you know, give me these are those let's keep trying. Um, again, Milroy, best hair in the Civil War, and um, you know, a, a tenacious guy, especially in the 1862 Valley Campaign. That guy, you know, 1862 is Milroy's year. Um, as a Union commander, he is very good. Um, doesn't make the best decisions as far as you know, politically and things like that, at, at least. Uh, but he's he's very he knows his convictions and he, he sticks with them. Um, but as a commander, he is probably the best commander that Fremont has uh, fighting against Jackson. Now, of note, before we get too far into that battle, Jackson does not ever get on the Cross Keys battlefield. He will come up to what's known as Mill Creek Church and meet a staff officer of yours. And that staff officer will tell Jackson the disposition of the troops. And Jackson said, very good, very good. And back to Port Public, he goes. The only battle that I know of that he does not actually get from the field at some point. Um, even at McDowell, even though he stayed down and shot reinforcements up, he's been up on the field. He's been up on the ridge at Southern Kins Hill. He doesn't do that at Port Republic. Doesn't even get to Artillery Ridge or anything. Um, and that, to me, that says something about his trust in Yule, uh, which, if you know anything about Jackson, him and his subordinates didn't always get along. Um, and, you know, Yule at first thinks he's crazy, but now he's he's apparently got his commander's trust. So that's a that's an interesting point there uh, of how much Jackson trusting his subordinate. Now you also could say. Maybe that's the fatigue starting to come in a little bit um, because, I mean, this has been a grueling campaign, and they just did a very big force march from Martinsburg, you know, up the valley uh, between Harrisburg and Stanton. So as the Battle of Cross Keys is happening or beginning, we're going to talk about Jackson. This is where that fourth battle comes in for me. So we've got Harrisonburg. It's a, like I said, slight battle. It's not a heavy, heavy battle, but an important battle because of the death of Turner. Then we've got Cross Keys starting. Now in the town of Port Republic, that cavalry that is supposed to be picketing and making sure that James Shields' army is, you know, they know they're coming, but kind of where they're at and how close they might be is not doing a very good job. Um, there's going to be accounts of some of the troopers are going to see Union infantry um, moving, Union cavalry moving into position near Port Republic, and they're not going to say anything. They're just going to ride the other way. Um, they will eventually, uh, there will be some word come to coming to Jackson that, hey, the Yankees are close. They're a lot closer than we think. They're right across the river. And Jackson... I really believe he might have been asleep at this point um, because he's up in his headquarters house. You know, he's got the stuff going on, uh, Fort Harrisonburg with Yule. I honestly think the man might have been you know, trying to get a nap because Jackson, his favorite place to nap was church. But uh, as religious as he was, his favorite place was to nap was there. But I think at this point he is, it's known that he would, he would sit down beside a fence and go to sleep. So if there's a lull, he may be going to sleep. And his answer to finding out that there are troops, you know, Union troops there is, we'll fight them. You know, <laughs> that's, that's what, what he says. So, um, and that's, that's perfect Jackson fashion. But what's going to happen is those Union troops, um, there's going to be a little bit of debacle with them. Uh, they're under Samuel Carroll. And uh, Carroll had fought at the Battle of Kernstown. So he's, he's a veteran officer. Uh, he's been in, in battles and uh, has fought against Jackson. And uh, at the time, he was the commander of the 8th Ohio. Now he's, he's commanding, he's still commander of the 8th Ohio, but he's also got some cavalry with him and some artillery. He's given a little command by James Shields in order to try to surprise Jackson and fill out where the Confederates are. Carroll is going to make a surprise attack on the Confederates in Port Republic. They're in camp. So the cavalry is not doing his job with picketing very much because they're, they're upset. I mean, it's kind of understandable. You know, you still do your duty, but at the same time, for an undisciplined unit to lose the commander that kept them together, it just at that point, they were not ready. Um, so with that, Carol 
He's trying to wait for the infantry that he's been assigned to come up with him. However, his artillery is going to shoot uh, the signal shot a little early. And once that happens, and of course, that alerts the Confederates that someone's there. Uh, he's going to have to dash across the South River into Port Republic with his cavalry and what artillery he has. Um, and he's going to, it's going to be chaos in the town of Port Republic. There's only two roads. There's Water Street and Main Street. And if you go there today, there's Water Street and Main Street. That's, that's all there is. Um, but so Jackson's headquarters is up off Main Street, up around the corner. And he's going to be uh, uh, woken up by this. Um, and you're going to have an untrained artillery unit. The Charlottesville artillery is going to be up there in camp. Uh, these guys have barely fired a shot in practice. Um, they are a very new unit. So a couple little factors are going to come up there. Uh, when the Union cavalry comes in, they're going to split. Some are going to go toward Jackson. Some are going to go um, try to kind of go across the bridge and things. Jackson is going to get on a staff officer's horse first before he'll finally get to Little Sorrel, his, his horse. And he's going to start galloping down Main Street as fast as he can. He's being chased by Union troops. Of course, again, it's havoc. It's chaos. His doctor, Hunter McGuire, is down uh, on Main Street. And he's near uh, the present-day church there. And he is admonishing the wagon drivers. Uh, the Wagoneers, he is uh, using a lot of cuss words and, you know, telling them about staying and what he will do to them if they run and all this. And he feels a hand on his shoulder in the middle of all of this. And Jackson basically says, hey, can you use different language to get them to do what you want to do? I mean, that's I'm paraphrasing, but that's basically what he's saying. The dude's getting chased down the middle of Main Street and he stops to uh, admonish his. Uh, surgeon saying, hey, hey <laughs> you know, don't cuss at him. You know, and I just I've always thought that was hilarious. Um and he'll Jackson will continue his ride and he'll cross the North River Bridge. Now this is the covered bridge at the time. Uh, meanwhile on Water Street, you know, there's Confederates and Union soldiers there. Uh there's a Union sympathizer to come out by the name of Downs. And uh, he'll be talking with a Yankee soldier and one of the Confederates who's from Port Republic will actually take a shot. And no one knows for sure whether he was shooting at Mr. Downs or he was shooting at the Yankee officer. I think he was okay if he hit either one of them that, you know, he was going to be the hometown hero um, because no one liked Mr. Downs because he was a union sympathizer. Um, one thing before I get too terrible far, well, we can talk about that before the Battle of the Republic. Uh, during this, Jackson, when he gets across that North River Bridge, he's going to turn around and he's going to see some troops in like this kind of bluish gray uniform. And he's going to think these might be some of his Alabama troops that got new uniforms. And they see an artillery piece and he starts yelling across the bridge for them to turn the guns and fire and all this. Well, one of the guys that, um, and I may not say his name right, but he's in charge of the gun, Gildea or Gildea. He, uh, his, you know, unit is the ones that has the gun. He's a Union soldier. Um, and one of the Union soldiers is going to look across the bridge, and, you know, Jackson's commanding them. But with all this chaos and across a covered bridge, they have absolutely no clue what he's saying. So one of the Union soldiers is going to say, all we saw was a Confederate officer waving his hands, looking frantic on the other side of the bridge, so we shot at him. Um, and that's exactly what they'll do. They'll shoot a round through the bridge, and Jackson will get up over the hill. He won't get hit by it. Um, he is going to go to another little hamlet that is no longer really in existence today. Uh, there's a road named ever. It was called New Haven. And so when he gets there, that's where his troops are camped. He's going to get William Tolliver. Uh, and again, we talked about that in McDowell. If you look at his name, it says Tollifero. Um, but it's Tolliver. I don't know how that works. <laughs> that's why I'm into the Civil War and not, you know, how names work. Uh, but He's going to get Tolliver's troops to come across, and they're going to start coming down toward the bridge. Thea has has an opportunity at this point. He can fire another round straight up through that bridge and take out a lot of men that are coming in and, and maybe even kind of stop this, this new Confederate thrust. 
Instead, he decides he's going to shoot into the bridge. So he tries to shoot in the side of the bridge in an effort to knock it down to keep all the Confederates from coming across. It doesn't do anything uh, other than throw up some splinters and things, and the Confederates will come, th come through and overrun his gun and him, um, taking that side of the field and kind of starting to reestablish their uh, presence in poor Republic. On the other end, up where Jackson's at Madison Hall, where Jackson's headquarters was, the Charlottesville artillery is going to hold their own. This is their first action. They are going to uh, start, you know, unloading. They're not going to run. Uh, where some of these veteran artillery units and veteran officers are going to take off, they're going to stand by and they're going to be what kind of beats the Union Army back on that side of the field uh, is they're just pouring as much artillery into them as they can. And that's going to kind of, uh, you know, tear them down. And they'll they'll retreat back across the Mill Race and across the South River and back toward James Shields, and uh, that'll end that little thing. Of course, Jackson will then have a little bit stronger picket line around Port Republic uh, during that time. Uh, but while all that has occurred, the battle across Keys is starting to rage, just east or west of them. Uh, probably about seven miles, give or take. Um, that battle, again, we talked about, you know, Milroy and them coming across and attacking Artillery Ridge. Great position. To the right, of, still on Artillery Ridge, you have um, one of my favorite characters in Civil War, Isaac Trimble. Isaac Ray really Trimble. He's a grumpy old man. He looks like a grumpy old man in his picture. You know, watch the movie Gettysburg. The, uh, I was to the gentleman, I cannot remember his name, the gentleman that plays Crimble in there, I just feel like he does he does justice to that character. Um, he just, he's absolutely amazing. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, he's, he's dead and gone now, but he just does a great job. And I can, it's almost, you could put the voice of that guy with Isaac Trimble in the field, and, and I believe they probably sound very well too. Um, Trimble is... Uh, He's a hard fighter, a little cranky, and he he likes he likes action. Um, Trimble is going to see that there the hill he the part of the hill that he is on is actually lower than the hill in front of him, and he's going to want to move out to this hill known as Victory Hill. Uh, there's a place called Victory School there. He's going to want to move to that area. Uh, we know there was a fence line there. So he is going to move his troops forward. There's going to be an account of one of the cavalry officers in that area is going to ride up, or, or it might have just been somebody on horseback, one or the other. They don't recognize Trimble because it's hot. He's taking his jacket off. He doesn't have his general markings. And they're moving, and this guy starts kind of yelling at him about these troops being moved up, you know, up here to Victory Hill. And Trimble, rather than identify himself right away, just kind of starts yelling back at him. And then eventually the guy figures out, oh, this is the general. I, you know, they, they figure it out. But uh, it's kind of funny. He doesn't identify himself as a general right away. He just starts arguing with the guy. Uh, so uh, I love the guy. He's just he's fun. Um, but he's going to move out to this position, and that is going to be a devastating position for the Union Army. Uh, as the – it's still raging over here on our left. Uh, the Confederate left at, at Artillery Ridge, more troops are moving, you know, east for the Confederate line. They still believe Trimble is back there on Artillery Ridge, but he's moved forward. The 8th New York, uh, predominantly a German unit, uh, will be marching toward Trimble. Um, they'll be laughing and singing and joking and hoo-hawing. Uh, there are no flankers out, so people on the sides. There is no skirmish line. They're just marching. Um, they don't feel, whether they didn't feel they were close enough to the Confederates or not, I'm not sure why. Their uh, commander never orders it. There was a rumor that apparently he was drunk. It seems to be the rumor anytime anything happens, you were drunk. <laughs> so, you know, anything bad happens, they were drunk. Um and not to say that that's not possible, <laughs> but these guys are going to march, and they're going to march into the teeth of about 1,600 muskets. Um, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but walking that that terrain, as you 
as they come up over the hill, the Confederates who are behind this fence are going to rise up and unleash hellfire on them to the point where one of the Confederates is going to say it looked like a flock of blackbirds just laying in the field of, of the clover um, because so many of them are going to fall uh, at close range. And it's it's just a devastating annihilation of a unit. The 8th New York basically ceased to exist. And that action only takes maybe 10, 15 minutes. Um, I'm, the 8th New York, I'm sure at, at least one or two of them probably fired back, but most of them probably just took off um, at this point. They've just come into a sheet of massed Confederate musket fire. Uh, you will have uh, a kind of a counterattack. Um, Trimble will move his troops out. They'll go into what's known as Trimble's Ravine. And the battle will progress from now we've got from Artillery Ridge to Victory Hill. Now we're moving to our right flank along Goods Mill Road. Um, and that is actually the best opportunity the Union Army has to beat the Confederates at Cross Keys is going to be on this right flank. They're going to have an artillery unit out there, um, and they're going, to, they're going to be hammering the Confederates. Uh, the Confederates are going to try to make a counterattack. It doesn't, doesn't work out very well. It will not be until Trimble's troops come in and the artillery ammunition starts running a little low and they're ordered to retreat that they're able to, um, able to kind of shore up that side of the line. Uh, this will be a big Confederate victory. Um, Cross Keys, you know, they are vastly outnumbered, but they're in a great position. So this is going to be a big Confederate victory. In the meantime, Yule has been told after this battle, his job is to keep Fremont where he's at, at least long enough for Jackson. Jackson's plan is to destroy one, turn on the other, and destroy that one. Um, good plan. Good plan but they can't get together because he's out overwhelmed if they do. So that's why Yule's at cross keys. Yule's orders now are to continue to deceive the Union Army and march to Port Republic and support Jackson. Once they get into the town of Port Republic, they're to burn the North River Bridge so that Fremont can't cross and then go attack James Shields. Yule is going to do that. He is going to march out. He's going to leave his campfires burning. In the meantime, our buddy Trimble is going to come to him and say, you know, we whooped them here. Let's, let's attack them. Let's go. And Trimble says, you know, or uh, Yule says, you know, our, our orders are to, this is our orders. We did what we were supposed to do. We're going down here. Um, and Trimble will keep going. You know, I want to go, I want to go, I want to go. And uh, he, he's going to implore, you know, let's attack them. We can take them. We've got this victory. And so Yule says, I tell you what, and again, I'm paraphrasing, but basically you go ahead. The rest of the army's going this way. Good luck. Trimble at that point will change his mind and say, okay, I'm going with you guys. Uh, <laughs> because now he's going to take his little 1,600 men and face 11,500. Uh, or, you know, by that time it's a little less, but still at least 8,000 or more. Um, not good odds. So Trimble is going to uh, decide he's going to go with you. Uh, but the Confederates will march out and they'll leave their fires and everything going and they're starting that crap. Or Port Republic. In the meantime, Jackson, uh, who's now very aware of where the Union troops are at Port Republic, he wants to start fighting at 5 a.m. In order to do that, his troops have to march out you know, by four at least to get onto the field correctly. There's going to be some delays. Um, the South River is angry, and it's going to get a lot angrier, not necessarily because there was a lot of rain at that particular point. It had rain, but the Confederates are going to have to make a makeshift bridge. Now, the town of Port Republic, the reason that that is such an important place, there's a mill race there, there's tanneries there, um, gundalow boats they would use in town. Uh, the river actually comes up to a point where the South River and the North Fork meet and then continue on up. They'll go all the way uh, down the valley to the Potomac. But they would use these gundalow boats there. So it's a big transportation hub, supply hub. Uh, taking things north up to Harper's Ferry. So there's there's another bridge that they're going to try to use the artillery for, but they've got to get the infantry across too. So they make a makeshift pontoon bridge out of wagons and boards. 
it is a rickety, rickety bridge. Um, there are some accounts, uh, you know, some of the soldiers are, are making bets on whether their buddies are going to fall in the river or not. And some of them do, and they drown and they die. But um, because of these guys marching across there, the constant swaying of, of, the, of the wagons and the boards makes Mother Nature not happy. The South River becomes very angry, and that's when she really starts to shake because of the movement even more right around those wagons. So that's when your guys start really falling in. Uh, but they will get across. Now, Jackson, to me, makes makes a, an error here. Um, he's going to make a lot of errors in this battle. Fort Republic will not be his best battle. Um, he is going, instead of taking Tolliver's troops, who are close, he's going to get the farthest unit away. I think it's the Stonewall Brigade. He's going to bring them forward, the 2nd and 4th Virginia. And he's going to make Tolliver be the, the hinge in York rather than bringing Tolliver, whose troops are right there, the day before saved him. Uh, he's going to leave them there as the hinge, as the connection to Yule, and he's going to bring his back. So that delays even more time, because now these guys have to march through the other guys to get onto the field. Uh, they will not start arriving on the field of Port Republic until about 6 o'clock. Now, uh, just to clarify, Cross Keys was June 8th. We're now in June 9th, uh, the morning of June 9th. So the Union troops there had a great position. Uh, they are going to be under a guy named Tyler. Um, again, we back in uh, you know we, we mentioned uh, Kernstown just a little bit at one point in the other video. Uh, at Kernstown, James Shields is in command. However, he's never on the field because he got injured. At Port Republic, he's in command, but he's never on the field because he's in Elkton or present-day Elton Conrad's store at the time. Uh, had he been on the field and this been a Union victory, he, or not even on the field, but had this been a Union victory, he'd have totally taken credit for it because that's what he did at Kernstown, even though he had nothing really to do with the battle, uh, a victory. Um, so 100% James Shield would, would have taken that. Um, and instead, he'll, he's going to blame Kyler for, for losing the battle. Uh, but Kyler's got a great position out there. He's got his... His troops in the down along Lewiston Main, um, in the area of Linwood. He's got his troops stretched out there in a, in a nice field, and he has an awesome artillery position called the coaling. Uh, it's called the coaling because they would take the trees down and make coal out of them. Um, this uh, is part of the Lewiston farm, and they, you know, it's it's more open than than it is today, um, but. It's a very open area, great artillery position. You can see everything from there. And uh, with the type of guns that the Union Army is going to use, um, I believe there were seven guns there. You're going to have three under Clark, which are rifled pieces at the very top. I believe that's battery of uh, fourth U.S. artillery. Um, you're going to have one under Robinson, which is a mountain howitzer, uh, or it might just be a howitzer. It's a howitzer. Uh, not going to be as shooting quite as far, but it's it's still pretty effective. And then you're going to have uh, Huntington's battery, Battery H. Um, the, these guys are Ohio troops, and they uh, have shells that have paper mache on them, so they're going to be a little delayed because it will rain. And what happens to paper when it gets wet? doesn't work right. So they're going to be a little delayed, but they're going to end up, their pieces are rifled, um, they also have some, uh, I believe they have a Napoleon with them as well. But three of his guns are going to be at this coaling. So you're going to have seven guns fired. The Jackson immediately, once, get, once he gets on the field, he's kind of sending his units in piecemeal. He's trying to do this quickly. Um, I think there's a couple reasons for that. Uh, normally, Jackson would get his units online and then make his attack. He knows Fremont is coming. Even though Yule stopped him, Yule is now moving toward him. Fremont is going to be coming toward Port Republic. He has to defeat James Shields before Fremont gets him. In fact, that morning, Fremont will march out. And luckily for the Confederates, he's going to march out in full battle line, expecting to renew the fight. They will, it will be all the way to Mill Creek Church, which is a good little trek before Fremont realizes 
Confederates are gone. They're going to march through their campfires and everything. He's expecting a fight the whole time. Um, and it's going to take time to go from that line of battle back into column to march down the road. So that's going to buy Jackson some time. But in the meantime, he's still shuffling units in. As soon as they come up, he's throwing them in. Your second and fourth Virginia are going to attack the coaling first. Uh, they are not even going to make it up the hill. They're going to get decimated by this artillery fire, not even be able to make it up, and they're going to be pulled back. Now, if you read the accounts from those guys, they are actually put to the rear, and they are angry because they have never been driven from the field. You know, they no, we've not done that. We've always stood our ground. So they're unhappy because they believe they could have attacked again, but they're pulled back. In the meantime, the fighting out in the fields uh, is going to be devastating. You have the 7th Indiana on the far right flank of the Union Army and the 5th Virginia on the far left flank of the Confederate. And uh, as these units, it's basically going to look like a tennis match for a little while. These units are going back and forth fighting each other across these fields. At one point, the 5th Virginia and 7th Indiana will have their own little civil war um, because of the smoke and everything, and they don't have anybody on their flank. They're not noticing all these guys over here moving. There's a river on this side. They're fighting, and then they kind of realize there's nobody else here. So then they will break off and kind of and go back. But they'll fight for a little while, just them. Um, in the meantime, the uh, – a, a Union counterattack is going to push the Confederates back just in time some of your forces have back. And I think it's the uh, 58th and 44th Virginia are going to slam into the flank of the Union troops that are starting to push back uh, Jackson's other Confederates. Uh, they're going to slam into that flank and, and stop that counterattack. The rest of Ewell's troops are going to start coming in line, and we're going to talk about the Louisiana Tigers. Uh, these guys are ruffians. They're Jackson's shock troops. He'll use them later, shock troops. These guys um, either could go to prison or fight in a war. So they got to kill, basically, they got paid to kill. Uh, so they were very happy about that. Um, Jackson doesn't really, they, they respect Stonewall Jackson, but he does not have a lot of power over them. They, they respect him, but they don't really care what anybody says. However, they to command these guys are two massive guys, especially uh, for what's known as Wheat's special battalion. You're gonna have a guy named uh, Chatham Robido Wheat. This guy is massive. Uh, I think it's said in his picture he's like 283. He's ever been a 300, if not more. Um, he's like six foot four. And then you're gonna have another guy who's gonna eventually be a general uh, by the name of Peck, who is. Just as big, he's definitely 300 pounds and well over six foot. And so these are the guys that are, in, that are commanding these ruffians, these Louisianians. And the Louisianians are going to advance through the woods and they are going to march up the coaling and attack the coaling. Now, when I say they're marching through the woods, the terrain does this, okay? So... These guys are tired. They just marched, you know, a good little ways. They're coming into battle, and they're marching over mountain spurs to get to this cold because uh, we're at the edge um, of the Blue Ridge Mountains at this point. Oh, excuse me. So they are uh, marching, and, and they're tired, but they're going to make this charge. They're going to charge up the cold, and they're going to take the guns at the cold. However... The 66 Ohio is kind of behind. That's the unit that's supposed to be protecting these guns. They're going to counterattack and push the Louisianians off. The Louisianians will regroup and they'll charge again. They'll hit them a second time. This is the third attack on the colon. Meantime, you still have all this fighting down in the uh, farmland below the colon. The colon is the key position. It's the hell spot on the battle. And as they attack, they, they will take the battery again. They'll take all these this area again. The problem is they're not able to hold it because now another of Clark's guns is going to come up from the river and start firing infilad into them. 
Uh, some of the guns are going to try to retreat, and you know Huntington's going to turn one of his guns back around and start shooting at them. And so they're going to be pushed off. But what they do is so that the Union troops cannot pull those uh, guns off, they start slitting the fronts of the horses. Now, and they just you know, leave them lay, and they're they're just that's. I mean, these guys are ruffians. They don't care. They're just going to do what they do. They come back down after being driven off again. Richard Yule is going to show up. Now, Richard Yule, you don't really hear a ton of things about him, about being it's, it's firing general. There's a few little things before he gets married where, you know, he. I think at one point he comes out in his pajamas and shoots at people uh, in the middle of a town. Uh, it was like a little raid, and he's cussing them. And then after he gets married uh, at Gettysburg, we see a whole different Yule who's the more pulled back, more more cautious. Um, but when Yule arrives on the field in Port Republic, he just looked at the men and he says, men, you know me. General Jackson wants us to take this, we take this hill and you know, we're going to do it. He doesn't even order the Louisianians to do it. They just get up, rebel yell, up the hill they go again. He's not told them to do it. He's still kind of probably standing there getting ready to give them more of a speech and they're running by him. Um, so as they go up, they're going to take those guns for a third time. And this time, they are going to be fighting the artillerymen. The 66th Ohio has kind of moved off because of another threat. So these artillery guys, you got to hand it to them. They're fighting with their spike, uh, with, with sponges, with you know, worms, whatever they have, small arm fire. They're going to fight the Louisianians. They're not going to give up their guns right away. But the Louisianians are going to overwhelm them and take the guns. At that point, the Union position is untenable. If the Confederates start firing down on them, it's over. So the Union is going to start retreating back to our comrade's store. Uh, Jackson's troops will pursue them for a while, but uh, you know he'll then fall kind of back, and uh, he'll be in command of the field. Now, Fremont, at the, almost at the perfect time, will show up. However, Yule has burned the North River Bridge and the bridge over at Linwood. So all Fremont can do is come up to the river and start lobbing shells into the field. It disgusts Jackson, and I'm sure it disgusts the other Union commanders as well, because he is firing onto all the wounded that are out there. He's not having any effect on the battle. He's not having any effect on Jackson. He's just firing artillery shells into the middle of this field where there's a, you know, at least 900 casualties in one spot. And it's some of his own, you know, his own army's men. He's just launching shells in there because, and I think that's an anger. He's angry because he didn't make it there in time. Um, but this is definitely Jackson's, out of the whole Valley campaign, I would say this is his worst battle uh, because of the way he puts his units in and because of the quickness that he's doing it with I, again, I think he's got the in the back of his head that Fremont's coming. I think, too, we're going to have the fatigue that's starting to kind of kick in after a long campaign. Um, and, you know, it, that gets brought up during the Seven Days campaign, but I think that's more of a not knowing the terrain, honestly. <laughs> I'm getting ready to do a tour on that. So it seems the more, the more I'm into it, the more I'm like, I, he just didn't know where he's going. <laughs> Uh, maybe a little lethargy, but um, I think we we do see the fatigue really coming in to Jackson at this point. Uh, but that that's basically the battles in a nutshell. Um, of course, you can look at certain units and follow them. Uh, anybody wants to learn about the Cross Keys battle, find the 15th Alabama on the map and just follow them. They are on every spot of that battlefield somehow. I don't know how they do it. They start the battle and they end the battle. Uh, they'll be on Artillery Ridge for a little bit. Then they're over here near near uh, Tremble, and then they go off to the flank. They're everywhere. Um, and these guys are the you know, 15th Alabama at Gettysburg. Um, these these are, you know, a, it's a famous unit. Um, but these guys are literally everywhere on the Cross Keys battlefield. Um, and then the one that you would probably want to study the most as far as the Confederate side uh, would be the Louisiana uh, troops uh, mm -hmm. there at the Uh As far as the Union side, you know, you really, 
you got to look at the eighth Ohio. You got to look at Tyler and Carroll. Um, those guys, they're, they're not bad fighters. They're good fighters. They just didn't have enough resource to back them up. Uh, their, their commander, not that great, in my opinion, um, because he's never really on the field. He just kind of trusts everybody else to do it for him, and he never sends them good reinforcements. On the other side, Fremont, um, not the best commander in the world. Honestly, the power behind Fremont was his wife, uh, Jessie. Um, and I'll back that up with anything. I mean, just read some of the stuff she did. That's the reason he's a general. Uh, so, and there's always, you know, the women are always the power behind the men, no matter what we say. Uh, Amen. So, Amen. Jesse Fremont is definitely his power. But I would, uh, if you wanted to study uh, the union side, definitely look at Milroy. Um, study Joe, uh, Julius Stahl as well. Um because he's going to start – he shows up here in the Valley a lot. Uh, but he's one that – you know, he's kind of lost during this battle. Um, but he, he's on that um, Confederate right flank. So, uh, you know, and, of course, the 8th New York, uh, God love them, they, uh, they had the worst day, I think, out of everybody. Even Jackson, you know, he got chased down the road. But these guys basically ceased to exist. So um, definitely, definitely some units to look into. Very, very cool histories with all of them. And to add to, to what you, you were saying, um, and we can talk about this here in a second when we talk about places to visit. Yeah. Unless you actually go to the colon, you don't realize how true of a key position this was. I mean, this, this cool. wasn't this wasn't just some, you know, hill mm -hmm. hillside. Um, I mean, this was almost straight up. If, if you walk up to the top of today, like the past zigzags going to yeah. the top, it's straight up. And what you see today is just a small portion. Um, so there's a driveway there, and the, and the people are, are very nice and own the house there at the top. The house, of course, was not there during the war. Um, very nice people, though. But the, the driveway, the hill has been somewhat altered because of man-made driveways and stuff. If you go to that property, though, and you if you're standing in the driveway, you look to the left, you'll see the original roadbed. And if you turn around, you'll see a driveway that goes across from the church. That is the original road. And that is where your flank of your Louisiana troops will be. They'll be right there on that road attacking Huntington's guns, which are setting. At, everybody thinks the guns are up on the hill. There's actually some down by the road. Right. And then, Robinson, and then you'll have Clark. And when you go there now, it's wooded. Most of it's wooded. You'll see that little spot like we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But there's a, a lot of woods up there. That wasn't like that. So Clark's guns are farther, even farther up the hill. Mm -hmm. So that's a uh, that's yeah. It's it's all inspiring to go up there and look and climbing that hill. No matter what shape you're in. Sucks. Yes. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I have to weed eat and mow it sometimes. So I, yeah, it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that and tell me if I'm wrong, but the way that they charged, they they had to cross that creek first. Yes, yeah, so thing. yeah, deep run. They're coming across deep run, so they're going across these these spurs, crossing deep run. And uh, I've been on that other side doing um, some some easement things. And if it's as thick then as it is now, which I'm pretty certain it probably was because they haven't turned changed much. Oh my gosh! In the middle mm -hmm. of summer, that's horrible. We, uh, myself and another guy um, from a different agency, um, had to go up through there. Uh, and oh, oh lord! <laughs> if I was doing everything, I don't think I'd have made it. <laughs> yeah, um, I was in long sleeves because I wear that for work, you know, because of bugs and stuff. But man, if I was in like all what they were wearing, um, mm -mm. <laughs> no, no, thank you. So if uh, people watching this want to visit the area, and they're in the they're in the Harrisonburg area. What are some sites that they can go check out? So in the Harrisonburg area, um, there in Harrisonburg itself, if you walk around town, there's a lot of Civil War trail signs, uh, especially in downtown near the library and, and places like that. Um, you can still go to the to the spring where the soldiers drank out of. It's still there. Um, the courthouse, that particular part of Harrisonburg, believe it or not hasn't changed much since the Civil War. As a matter of fact, the road actually got smaller, which is not normal. You it, but it actually got smaller based on some of the pictures uh, from back in the day. Um, you can go there. 
uh, you can go to the Hardesty Higgins house, a um, very old house used as a headquarter quarters by Nathaniel Banks. Um, we do have a, the Shadow Valley Battlefields Foundation does have a uh, orientation in there that will uh, probably be updated before too terrible long uh, with some new, new material in there. Uh, but that's a good little place, a little coffee shop in there, some good stuff. Um, that's just that part of Harrisburg. Uh, you can also, just up from that is the Woodbine Cemetery. There's a uh, uh, Confederate resting place there. There's also a guy named Joseph Latimer. Uh, he's called the Boy Major, and I failed to mention him during the Battle of Cross Keys. Um, that's where he's going to get his name, the Boy Major, uh, because he is very good with his artillery um, and, and commanding it. And so he's actually buried at Woodbine Cemetery in Harrisonburg. Uh, and then you can visit the Turner Ashby Monument. Um, up off of uh, University Boulevard, or is it Neff? I think it's Neff, actually. That's, that's yeah. right. um, but it's across from Dream Come True Park. It's uh, in your side, their brown side, so you turn Ashby Monument. Um, you can go to the approximate spot where Ashby's killed uh, there in the city of Harrisonburg. And, and like I said, it's not a lot that's safe, but there is some safe, so it's definitely worth going to. Uh, just to be able to, you can walk down the hill and then walk up as the Union Church did, or you can be up here with as the Confederates and and see what they're seeing. So uh, you still get a good idea of of what was happening there. Um, that's just Harrisonburg itself. Um, if you travel, you want to go to Cross Keys, you would travel east on Port Republic Road out of the city. Uh, as you're going to come up to the intersection of Port Republic and Cross Keys Road. If you were to look to your left and right in 1862 on June 8th, you're going to see nothing but Union troops there. Uh, that is going to be kind of the starting point for these guys. Um, Oak Ridge, I believe it's called. That, that's where these guys are going to be. And they're going to start uh, moving you know, toward the Confederates. If you made a right off of Port Republic Road on the Cross Keys, your next left would be Battlefield Road. Uh, you'll see some signs along the road. And then you can go to uh, where the battle starts. Uh, you can pull into the Ruiton Club. There's a cemetery there um, with a lot of old graves, uh, some Revolutionary War. And this is where the, the 15th Alabama is loading their weapons. They're in that cemetery using using the uh, tombstones as, as cover. Um, and then you can kind of, at that point, you can look out and really see this Confederate, where this Confederate line would be. Uh, if you were to continue out Battlefield Road, it'll bring you back to Port Republic Road. Directly across from that, to your right, would be Artillery Ridge. Directly across from that is what's known as the Widow Pence House. Up west of the Widow Pence House on the same property is the site of the 8th New York. There's a Civil War trail sign out there, um, and there, there is a trail that goes out there. Um, right now, it's not necessarily open to the public 100% yet. Uh, but that's being worked on um, because obviously we want people to go there. I mean, that's that's part of it. You can't learn if you can't get on the ground. Uh, that, if you can get there, uh, if you're able to go up there, that 8th New York site, I've done both sides. I've given tours there. If you go and you walk up that crest, as the Union troops did, you can't see anything until you top that hill. If you're on the Confederate side and someone's walking, I'm going to see you well before you see me. And that's why it's become so devastating. The, the visual is just amazing. Um, scary, honestly. Uh, you know, I just can't imagine what those guys went through once they got up there on, on the top of that knoll. Um, so you can visit that. The Widow Pence Farm was there. Um, soldiers were treated there. It was a, it was a hospital. Um, great little little place. Uh, it is privately owned, so or it's owned by the foundation, but it is a private residence um, at the moment. But that uh, hopefully at some point all that will be opened up. Um, you can also travel past the Widow Pence Farm if you continue east. On your left, you'll see Mill Creek Country Store. Great little store. Uh, that has been open maybe a year, I think, year and a half. Um, good sandwiches, very good sandwiches in there. Uh, but if you stand there, uh, 
you are standing in Trimble's original position. If you go out to the Widow Pence Farm, you're going to his next position, the Victory Hill position. Uh, but you're standing where Trimble was, his troops. And you can really see, as you look out, you'll see that Victory Hill is a little bit higher. Um, so that's definitely a place to go. Uh, Artillery Ridge, you go up Artillery Road to Bowtie Lane, and it'll take you to a place called Mill Creek Ridge. Um, Artillery Ridge is actually to the right of that. Although it's the same ridge, you know, artillery was to the right, and so that's why we, we differentiate. Uh, where Mill Creek Ridge is, is the uh, position of the Maryland. Uh, Stewart, uh, Maryland troops were there. Uh, there is a Civil War monument to Maryland there. Um, and so you'll see that, and you can actually see the uh, the old road that was there that the Alabamians would have come up. Great story about that. I was giving a talk there. And I'm talking about, you know, the Alabamians are under fire and they're coming up this road. And at the perfect time, his dog just jets out of the road. And I'm like, he's the 15th Alabama. That is the first thing to get out. Um, the other place to see in Cross Keys is a place on Goods Mill Road. Um, I don't recall the address, but you'll see a, a Civil War trail sign. There's a little trail that takes you to several times there near Tribble's Ravine. And that is your final attack thing. Um, so that you can you can basically see the whole battlefield in different sections. Um, and if, if you get a map and just follow that, like I said, follow the 15th Alabama, you'll be everywhere on that map. Uh, you can't go a little bit farther down the road and pull into the parking lot of the Mill Creek Church. Uh, that church was there. Now, obviously, it's been updated. Uh, but that church was there, and it said that the arms and legs were stacked up to the first story window. Uh, hmm. Which is just, I mean, it doesn't sound, it's like, oh, it's one story, but when you start thinking about stacking arms and legs, pretty gross. Right. Uh, right. You can be there, and I can tell you that the fields behind the church, some of the Louisiana troops are going to be staged there. They don't fight in cross keys, but they are brought up this battle. Um, but they never have to fight in that battle. They, of course, they'll fight the next day. Um, that's pretty much most of what you can see in cross keys. Um, and we do, the Shenandoah Valley Battle for the Foundation does have some, some driving guides and things. Um, you can stop in any of our places. I think there in Harrisonburg, they may have them in there. Um, I have to check and see if they need to be replenished or not, but, uh, we try to have at least some, some driving tours, uh, just to kind of give you an idea of where you're at. Um, and again, hopefully what's the plan is for that to be, become more of a battlefield experience eventually. Um, if you're going to Port Republic, uh, when you get into the town of Port Republic, if you drive up Main Street and you go uh, south, you'll run into the present day Madison Hall. That house uh, was actually burned uh, after Jackson occupied. It was burned later and a new house was rebuilt there, but basically on the same foundation, the same area. If you're standing in Madison Hall, you're in the area of the artillery uh, reserve of the Confederate Army. You're going to see where, you know, Jackson was. You're going to see where the Charlottesville Artillery is going to make their stand. Mm -hmm. If you go back down the other way, uh, if you go north on Main Street and cross Port Republic and continue, uh, it'll wrap around, but you'll, if you stop there, you will actually come up on the remnants of the North River Bridge. Uh, so you can walk out to that and see where that bridge went across to New Haven. And that's going to be, you know, where Jackson takes the cross and shot at. Um, and yelled like a frantic man on the other side to nobody that can hear you. Um, but <laughs> and then if you you come on around the turn, you get to go to the Frank Kemper House. Um, that is now run by Shadowland the Battle the Foundation. That is the house that Turner Ash has taken to. It's also the Port Republic Museum. Um, it is really neat to go in there, not just because of the Civil War stuff, but there's a lot of local things in there. The town. Um, it's very historic. The people love their history there. And so going into that museum, hopefully it'll be open a little bit more this year. Um, unfortunately, we kind of took it, they kind of took it over during COVID. So <laughs> it's, you're trying to revamp that and get things going. Um, that should be opening actually fairly soon. Uh, usually museum season is kind of April to April to October or so. Um, but that museum, again, a lot of local history there. 
and uh, shoot, half the townspeople, if you talk to them, they can tell you just about anything you want to know uh, about the local history there. And they, they know a lot. Um, and they're very good. It's a great resource to have if you're, especially if you're in the Civil War, uh, you know, with all the Civil War stuff that happens there. Uh, but if you continue, uh, if you continue south on Water Street, on your left, you'll see Bradbury Park. Uh, you can walk down and you can see the mill race and the uh, um, little cement slab, the slab bridge that was out there. You can walk up to the, the South River, beautiful area, and see where the soldiers would have swam and had their fun during camp. Um, you can continue up, and there's there's signs throughout the town as well that kind of explain not just the Civil War, but what's happening in the town during this whole time, during the whole 19th century. Um, so there's a lot to learn there, and a lot of the houses are the same houses that were there during the Civil War. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's some modern houses, but there are a ton of houses that are, are you know, saw this battle, saw all this activity. Um, as far as the battlefield itself, the Battle of Fort Republic, if you, uh, once you come out of town, if you turn on a, I believe it says Tiger Camp Road. The Tigers did not camp there. I don't know why it's named that. I think it's just because it was fun. Uh, but the Tigers didn't camp there. Um, anyway, you could turn on that. You'll turn into what's known as Jackson, it's called Jackson's Way. That road is, uh, it used to be a dirt road. Now it's a pavement. Uh, man, I sound old saying that. Uh, <laughs> but it, it takes you right down the middle of the, of the Port Republic battlefield. You, as you're going up, you can kind of see the tolling in the distance. It's unfortunately wooded. I don't want to say unfortunately, but their their woods are kind of in your way on that. When you come out, uh, if you go up that way, you make a left, you can go to the coaling. If you were to come straight up Port Road instead of taking Jackson's Way and go down, you still look at your left and your right. You're going through the battlefield. You'll see the open fields. Um, when you get to the uh, on to what's known as Route 340 Southeast Side Highway, the intersection of Orbank Road and Linwood Road is where the coaling is. The coaling is to your right on Orbank Road. Um, and you'll you'll notice that there's a, a marker out there. Um, we're going to have some more signs. There's actually a sign that says Port Republic Battlefield Marker. There will be more signs out there eventually um, and some updated material. But you can turn in there. You can park in the church parking lot. You can walk up uh, at least a portion of the coaling. And when you get to the top and turn around, you'll see the road. You can, if you look, you know, directly diagonal from you, down toward the corner of the field, that's where your Fifth Virginia guys are to start. And that artillery is launching right into them. I've been on that other side, man. We look back at the coaling, and I can tell you, if I was a soldier there, um, that would have just not been fun. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a terrible place to be. I definitely wouldn't want him to keep moving. Um, so, yeah, the Coley is definitely a must-see spot in Port Republic. Again, that's, the, you know, Robert Craig says it, and I've said it, that's the hell spot. Every battlefield has a hell spot, but Coley is the Port Republic hell spot um, because that, that's the anchor. It's everything for the, for the Union Army there, and it's everything for the Confederate Army, too, because if they don't take it, they're not going to win. Um, so yeah, definitely a lot to see there, and hopefully there will be a lot more to see uh, in the coming future uh, here within the next couple of years, uh, maybe even the next year or so. But um, with you know availability and accessibility, so keep your eyes open for that. Uh, definitely, if you can, um, to your viewers, follow the Shenandoah Valley Battlefields Foundation's uh, Facebook page because there's a lot of updates that come out on there. Um, obviously, become a member if you can. Uh, it's like 35 bucks. It is nothing. Um, but, you know, we've got our annual conference coming up, so they're going to be going um, right now to New Market and a bunch of other places. But, you know, Port Republic is is one of those one of those places where you say something about Jackson's Family Campaign, like you were saying earlier, people know they know Port Republic and Cross Keys. I think it's because those battles happen so close together. Um and the funny thing is they're not needed battles. Jackson, I should have said this earlier, but Jackson's already accomplished his goal by the time these battles happen. Right. He, he, they don't right. have to, but he does any. Um, so, yeah, just uh, I'll get off my soapbox on there. <laughs> but uh, a 
lot to see there. Uh, just some amazing stuff. And to stand on that ground uh, is always homely. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I was going to if, – if you didn't do it, I, I was going to do the sales pitch for the Shenandoah Valley Battlefields Foundation. <laughs> I'm a member myself, and I, I love seeing the work you, you guys are doing. Um, also, sh- shout out to the Battlefields and Bourbon podcast. I, yeah. I know you mentioned Mill Roy, and that's that's Jack's guy. I mean, oh, absolutely, Jack. Um, Jack Owens, uh, one of my coworkers and, and one of the hosts of the Battlefields and Bourbon podcast. He uh, he got me hooked on Mill Roy. I got to give you credit. I started to make it a little different, and I was like, yeah, Jack's right. And I started yeah. looking into him. That dude is something, especially in '62. Yeah, absolutely. And you're right. Best hair in the Civil War. Oh, I, I, I'm just hair great hair. Beautiful. <laughs> and I'm, I'm not, obviously not biased in my hair. <laughs> you know, there's nothing I can say about it. Uh, my best hair is right here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Battlefields and Bourbon podcast, great podcast. Uh, getting more recognized each day. Um, yeah. Becoming, I think, a, a really prominent force in Civil War history. And um, just to kind of throw it out there, because some people don't realize, uh, a podcast is more of a discussion, um, not necessarily a lecture. You know, a lecture, you're getting your facts, you're getting all this, where in the podcast, you're getting facts and things, but you're also getting the opinion of three historians, um, right. three historians or whoever their guest is, three historians, which just then Jack and Elijah, two historians, but you're getting the opinions of these guys who have who have looked at this stuff, and not only even if it's battles, they haven't really learned about as much or haven't been on the field. Um, I'm fortunate enough; I've been to a lot of places. Um, they they're willing to learn, so it's you get to learn, you get to go on that journey and learn with them, and that's uh, that's why I think their podcast is becoming so successful. Um, besides having me on there, of course that. Oh, uh, oh yeah, yeah. Um, the, the, no, those guys are really good I really enjoy doing it with them um, I'm very proud of both of them for taking the plunge at their age to do what they're doing and I, I can't say enough good things about both of those guys yeah they're they're great and we're trying to get Jack on here he, he said he would do um, I think third, third Winchester is oh, his yeah. Forte. Um, yeah but... Win- Winchester anything Winchester you get him talking about Star Fort, you'll never get him off there. <laughs> I've I, I've actually learned that th- through text. Yes, he was a big Star Fort guy. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on, Aaron. Uh, we'll yeah. put your your stuff below so people can subscribe to it. Um, like I said, it's stuff that you won't see anywhere else. Um, uh, Aaron goes where no one else no one else goes. Yeah, and you know I've got uh, I'll have another kind of off the beaten path video coming out uh, before too long. Um, we'll have some stuff on the seven days campaign. Like I said, I'm, I'm getting ready to do a tour on that. So it's kind of hard to go there and not. Right. Know, but again, right. There's going to be, even though we think we know all those battles, there are little battles we forget about down there. So, um, you know, I may sneak some of those in. <laughs> I'm sure I will. Cause that's well. I can um, so definitely be on the lookout for that. Uh, you know, I'll be uh, editing some videos here before too long because it's been two weeks. So you got to keep it going. Yeah, uh, I, I understand that. Well, thanks for coming on, Aaron. Um, we, we 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 greatly appreciate you. And uh, go check out Aaron's stuff. Go check out the Shenandoah Valley Battlefields uh, Foundation. Become a member and help support what they do so they can create a better Civil War experience for, for everyone. Absolutely. Uh, I will say for anybody that's interested, uh, May 17th and 18th, we're going to have the 160th anniversary of New Market. Um, and that's going to be a pretty big deal because the battlefield is changing, um, going back to its 1864 look. And uh, it's just it's just going to be amazing. And, and people that maybe have not been to New Market in years are just, it's going to blow your mind. Um, and, uh, you know, definitely a lot of work being put in there. And, uh, can't wait for the for the anniversary. Yeah, um, I I can't either. That's that that's a place that's near and dear to my heart. Yeah. Right. Well, thanks again, Aaron, and we'll catch y'all on the next video. Yep. Thank you.